So I'm going to continue in my series. I'm not uh, doing necessarily a Mother's Day message today. We're just going to continue in our series. Sometimes I go that direction. Sometimes I don't. Uh, you can always look online for past Mother's Day messages if you want to be encouraged that way uh, because I've, I've spoken uh, uh, 30 since I've been here. Uh, but God uh, is really dealing with us about being in the kingdom, being in the kingdom and what that means. And um, let's, let's look into the scriptures today and, and really look and see from God's perspective. The name of this series is Kingdom Perspective. Let's say that. Kingdom Perspective. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus said, do not fear, little flock. And we brought that into context from last week where he was saying, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about clothing. Don't worry about, trust me even in the little things. And then he says, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Say this with me today. I have the kingdom. The kingdom is within me. If Christ is in me. And I don't want to put any doubt in there, but you need to make sure that Christ is in you. How many of you know he's the king of the kingdom, right? So Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, don't seek after the world, don't seek after all these other things, but he says, seek first. Everybody say first. first. Seek first in priority the kingdom of God and then all these other things that you've been looking at and, and, and desiring in, in, in a sense, not in a worldly carnal way, but the desires that God has put in your hearts. He goes, I'm gonna fulfill all, all those things. I'm going to give you the right husband. I'm going to give you the right wife. I'm going to put you in an area where I'll be faithful in that geographical area to meet with you and to influence people around you for the kingdom's sake. Use your gift. Everybody has a gift. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things are going to be added to you. Now go with me over to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. It says this, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And, and I'm going to continue here, and it says, And healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went through all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments. They had never seen a rabbi that reached out and touched the physical needs of the people. And they were astounded at all of the healing that took place during that time. They didn't have modern medicine back then. There were all kinds of different things that would come through, plagues and diseases, and people just had to endure through those. And they had these homemade uh, remedies and, and traditions of men, you know, to, to help in the area of your physical body. But many had ailments uh, during that time. And it, the Bible says, his fame went through all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. How many of you know today that, that Jesus isn't just, he's, he's not just, he's not looking at your past today. He's looking at you in the present of life. A lot of us, all we see is the perspective of past, how can God do anything in our lives when I had all this hanging on? When I did this or when I did that? I've had people through the years say, uh, Mike, if I ever came into the congregation, I think lightning would come down and strike the whole bunch. So I'm going to refrain from coming. I said, I think God can handle you. But I want to say, Jesus meets us in the present of our life. 
in the now of our life. Faith is now. Now faith is. It's the present tense in our life. We can't redeem or fix anything from the past, but the Lord can. So he deals with us in the present and in the now of our life. That's today. The reality of kingdom life is how we live in our present that will govern how we will reap a harvest for our future in the kingdom of God. Remember this, that God frees us from our past. Aren't you glad about that today? He frees us from all that junk, all that stuff. The Bible says that he will erase all that stuff as far as the east is from the west. I'm so glad today that he's not holding that over my head, that I don't have just one more drop in the bucket that's going to put me over the edge where he's going to judge me in my life. All of the wrath that God had in that Old Testament type setting was put on Jesus. And he took that to the cross. Some of you need to say this to yourself periodically. God's not mad at me anymore. He's not mad at me. Now, if there's some stuff you need to repent of, obviously you need to repent and change your ways. But God's not mad at you to the point he would pour out wrath why he sees the blood of Christ in your life. That covers, not only covers, but it washes and cleanses us from all that junk in our life. Listen to this. Remember, God's kingdom frees us from our past, meets us in the present, and gives us solid hope for our future. How many of you know your future is set in the things of God? As we look at the passage today, and I promised you last week that we would go here. As we look in this passage today in the Sermon on the Mount, it's sometimes thought of as as a Jesus declaration of the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and Matthew chapter 7, he preached the most unbelievable message that had never been heard before in those chapters. And so here we start out here in Matthew chapter 5. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles there to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 1 says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. I want you to, I want you to see something. Jesus was continually looking at the multitudes, not with disdain, not with this, you should be better, this get better, get right, da 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 Jesus looked at the multitudes, the Bible says, with compassion. He loved the people that he made. We've got to get that perspective because we'll never do anything in the kingdom if we think that God is against us. And it's all about rules and regulations. How many of you know it's much, much more? It is relationship with a God who loves us and has poured out his best for our life. So seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to him. Who came to him? The disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them. This was a message for the disciples that the crowd would hear. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now remember, Jesus is going about and he is preaching the kingdom of God, the good news of the kingdom. This is what Matthew says. And so here's part of it. Blessed. Everybody say blessed. How many of you are blessed in this room? Every day I wake up and I go, Lord, I am blessed and favored of the Lord. Lord, your hand is upon me, not because of anything that I've done, because the blood of Christ is in me. Amen? 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. This doesn't look like a good thing to me. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that there's actually a possession here of they have something. But how can you be blessed if you're poor in spirit? Jesus was giving such hope to the hearers of this message. All of us start at ground zero when it comes to initial faith in Christ. There is a complete lack in every person to save ourselves. Jesus is saying there is hope for the person who is in utter despair, utter despondency, and complete poverty of spirit. If you have nothing and you're empty, and which all of us are until we come to Christ, it's emptiness. There's a void on the inside of us. But there's something that's drawing us. And what is that? It's the Spirit of God to know who God is and what he can be in our hearts. And as we identify with him, things start to fall off. But at the beginning stages, we're absolutely poor. There's a lack there. Where were you before you came to Christ? Where was your life today? Anybody lily white in here? Anybody have it all together when you came to Christ? I'm glad God divinely interrupted me from my stupidity. I'm glad that God came in and decided to, decided to uh, bring about in a really uh, radical way in my life because I had to be delivered from things. And he was the only one that could do that. I had to be delivered of the way that I looked. I had to be delivered from the way that I did things. I had to be delivered from myself because I was so self-absorbed. Jesus, today I want you to know this isn't something that you just add to your life. Jesus is something that you dedicate your whole spirit, soul, body to him. And he begins to change things on the inside. But you start off completely poor. And praise God that God loved us enough to send us his son and gave his son for us that we would have eternal life. How many of you know that's a starting point? That's what this poor in spirit is. He's looking at his disciples and he says, you see all these crowd around you? Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there's hope for each and every person today. Nobody's left out of that. If they'll recognize their lack and void in life, they can be partakers of the kingdom. That's why we have great psalms today. And like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not be in lack. Amen? Why? Because you're a possessor of heaven and he's poured it out for you. Let's look at this next attribute here. It says, blessed are are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We're talking about kingdom people today and everybody going through this particular process. When my mom passed away, uh, and, and, and my mom and my dad, both there was a mourning time uh, for me. There's been several people in my life where uh, that have passed away at, at different times. Uh, Marty Harris, our, be our beautiful secretary and friend of ours for so many years when she passed away, it just, it touched my heart. I saw her, I saw her in the hospital and um, her lifeless body was right there. And I, and I immediately said, I looked down at, down at her, kissed her cheek. And if you know Marty, she always had a little smirk. 
And she always had that little, like, I know something you don't know. I reached down and, and kissed her cheek, and I said, who's going to take your place? Who's going to step up and be the woman of God? But there was a mourning process in that, that somebody had passed, and I'm not going to see them anymore in this life, but how many of you know, we'll see her again. I'll see my mom and dad again. And we need to live in the moment while people are here and in, enjoy the process with them and walk with them uh, in life and, and make sure that when it comes to that, that, that point of losing that life, that you said everything that you're going to say, that you've been there in a certain sense. The Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The ancient Greek grammar indicates an intense degree of mourning. This is speaking of. Jesus does not speak of a casual sorrow for the consequences of our sin, but a deep grief before God over a fallen state. You know, I often wonder when Jesus was at the tomb of Lazarus and all of the people were crying and, and saying, if you were only had been here. And the Bible says that Jesus wept. But he knew already that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And I think in that moment that, how many of you know, he came as, as, as God to us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, but he was also a man. And he was touched in his motions from the fallen state of man. And with people without hope, and he groaned on the inside. He wept uh, on the inside because he knew. he knew. He was the resurrection and the life. But he was mourning for the sickness of sin and where it had brought a fallen world without hope. This mourning for us today is that godly sorrow that is needed to bring us to a decision of asking Christ to come into our fallen state and rescue us. The great promise in this passage is the comfort we sense in our old life dying and our new life in Christ coming alive to the things of God. Again, from a place of total lack in spirit, which brings humility to recognizing sin's grip in our life. That's the place where somebody needs to turn. Somebody needs to go towards God. Somebody needs to turn away from an old life and come into this new, fresh place in God. And how many of you know that takes repentance? Repent today can be a, a terrible six-letter word for you. That is six letters, right? Yeah. but it really just means changing your mind, changing your heart direction and going the direction of God. The comfort that we sense here in this passage and rest comes from repenting and turning from what was to a brand new life in the kingdom of God. The next scripture says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This next progression in the kingdom is in the arena of meekness. The world is so out of control. Say anything, do anything, and usually pay the consequences for the actions. We know as we watch the news today that people think that they can get away with anything, and they're pretty brazen about it lately. Have you noticed that? that more and more you see where the media is going towards these, these things. They say the most, uh, uh, they say these things that are outright lies. And, they, and, and later on, there's no repentance for that. But they've, they, they've slander 
and they, and they come against, and it, it's just like the enemy uh, today in that arena because they, they just say things and they do something and they, they don't think there's going to be a consequence. How many of you know there are consequences for what we say and do? People in the world who have power and influence will push over boundaries and force issues to get what they want because it benefits them. They want to get to that place. They don't care what it takes to get to a certain place in life. Many of you have experienced this trampling before, getting to the top. That's a worldly perspective that, that Jesus is saying here, hey, that's not in the plan for kingdom people. You can enforce dominion over principalities and powers and demonic forces that are set against your life. How many of you know you have authority today over those things? You have authority over principalities and powers trying to rule and reign in the hearts of people, but you can't make people do what you want them to do. They have to hear from God. They have to hear from heaven. And many of them aren't going that direction. So you do what you need to do in the heavenlies. And how many of you know that God will do what he needs to do as far as in humanity? It should not be this way for kingdom people. Jesus said later in Matthew chapter 20, he said to his disciples, because there was a dispute among them that who should be the greatest. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 24, it says, he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, what does the Bible say? Let him be as the younger, and he, and, and, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I, be listen to this, listen to what it says. And I bestow upon you a kingdom. Everybody say a kingdom. Just as my father bestowed one upon me. In the book of Revelation, it says this. It says that we're called to be, and many times we say, kings and priests. In the line, that we're called to be kings and priests. You know what that word king actually means? He says, you have been called to be a kingdom and in a kingdom and priests before the Lord. Mediators, in a sense, before the people, before God and the people. God has given you a kingdom today that we need to function correctly in that kingdom, not to look like the world, not to be caught up in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, but to really be the kingdom people that he's called us to be. Unless you are, you will never do things and reach out and do exploits for God. Meekness is not, don't get me wrong, meekness is not this gentle, you know, it's not this mamby-pamby thing. It's... It's not inactive passivity today. Meekness, according to what we've heard through the years, is meekness is power that's under control. Strength under dominion. Listen to this. Meekness is not inactive passivity, but it has learned the value of being teachable with restraint and submission to the master's will. I always get this in this particular passage. I always get this picture in my mind of the Clydesdale horses 
you know, Budweiser used to have the best commercials uh, during the Super Bowl when they'd have those Clydesdale horses and uh, these big Clydesdales. And how many of you know, if one of those came close to you, they'd stomp your head in the ground. They're, they're so much taller than any of us in this room. And uh, you look at these uh, six to eight Clydesdales that are pulling this wagon, and you just go, wow, what a power of strength. But really, who has the strength in that particular thing? Whoever has the reins. Because they've learned that even as much power as they have to pull this wagon, one tug of the master's reins, left or right, can take that wagon in a whole new direction, wherever he wills. And it might not be where we want to go, because we are the horses, believe it or not. And we need to recognize the power that's within us. That's meekness. And that these horses just didn't line up like that. How many of you know they all had to be trained one by one? Horses have temperaments just like people have temperaments. And God knows exactly how to reach each and every one of us so that we line up. And you know, it, notice it's just not one Clydesdale that's pulling that, that wagon. It's many that are together and learn to work together and to move together. Weakness is, or meekness is not weakness, but meekness is power. Say meekness is power. It's power. You're teachable. You've learned to come under the master's hand. And when he says go right, you go right. When he says go left, you go left. When he says, just go straight and keep on the narrow. How many of you know that's what we do? It is recognizing great power and authority under the control of the creator's plan today. The promise is what? To those for, that, that have this attribute of meekness and have been trained by the Lord. The promise is inheritance in the kingdom of God in this life. God can always use a dedicated, teachable, available vessel that is surrendered to his will and his ways. God is looking just for a willing vessel today. If you start looking at yourself as great, how many of you know you're in pride? So we have to keep that humble attitude before the Lord, but at the same time, knowing that he has powerful things to do on the face of the earth. The Bible says this over in the book of Daniel. It says, those who know their God will step out and do exploits for him. Those are those, those unbelievable places uh, in the kingdom, in, in time, as time goes on where you reach out and do something that's incredible for God, knowing that it's not in your strength, it's not in your power, but he teams you up with other people and something productive and great is done in the kingdom. The Bible goes on here. And I'm, you, you guys realize I'm not going to get through uh, the, all the blessed today, Right? You realize I'm not going to get through all these beatitudes. This, this is the last one we're going to do here. And then we'll hit it again next week. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, filled to overflowing. Some of you have looked a little bit emaciated lately. You look like you haven't been filled for, for days and weeks and years. God wants to fill you today. Once you've experienced Christ, his presence puts an insatiable hunger and thirst for more of him. Have any of you ever been in a service where you were so drawn and you, you felt the Holy Spirit being poured out in your midst? 
and it was just, it was drawing you to the, the throne room of God. Whether it was in prayer, whether it was in praise and worship, whether it was the word being delivered, whatever it was, it could have been in your room when you were having your devotions before the Lord and you, you set aside a, a little bit of time for him. And he met with you. And it was, it was so palatable. It was, it was so rich that you, that you feel like that you could have cut the presence of God with a knife. It was so tangible. Have you ever been in those times with the Lord where he just met with you? I can remember being uh, in Hamilton, Montana. I was working at the IGA and I was going, God, what in the world am I doing here? I know I'm not called to this. I know that this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. And I was, I was trying to be faithful to my job, but at the same time recognizing this deep hunger for more of the Lord and, and really coming in to the gifting that was in my life. And I was, so I was just doing whatever it was to, to take care of Corolla because, you know, she she's, needs to be taken care of. She's an incredible woman. I, that's all I'm going to say there. So I was doing whatever it was to put, put food on the table. There, there weren't tons of jobs in Hamilton, Montana at that time. It, it, it had a lot more poverty there than it does here, in a sense. Wages were way, way down there. As, as opposed to areas like this. Well, I can remember, make a long story even longer probably. Um, I can remember being up there in the break room at IGA going, what in the world am I doing up here? God, you have to meet with me. God, you have to pour out from heaven. Deliver me from this place. My, the managers at that time were, they weren't terrible people, but they were terrible to work for. And, and, and just to be in that environment, I had a fully possessed box boy who was watching snuff films and telling me about it. And, 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 and just full blown. And I met with this kid. And my heart went out to him because he was just reaching out to something that was real for him. And so he was drawn towards this satanic oppression. And he actually looked at me and talked to me when I took him out. And we were, we were having like a, a lunch type thing. And, and he looked at me and in another voice of the, in the demonic realm, looked at me and said, I like what I'm doing. And I go, I rebuke this devil from hell in the name of Jesus. And immediately, that voice left. Immediately, things came into place. And then he talked to me. I was talking to the person again. Because he was so under the control of something totally out of this world and demonic. So that was my work environment a little bit. So I'm working at this IGA, crying out to God, calling out to the Lord, Lord, deliver me from this place, and Lord, bring me into what you've called me to do because there wasn't a satisfaction at all. And the Lord, in that break room, nobody else was in there. The Lord came in, and I felt the presence of God come in so strong. And he goes, Mike, if you'll just be patient, I'll bring you to that place where you're going to see breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough in your life. And by this time, I'm, I'm a puddle. I'm a mess. I, I don't think anybody came in, and if they did, they turned right around and went the other way. Because I'm weeping before the Lord, knowing that there's more 
in the kingdom. And when you begin to hunger and thirst after righteousness, you come into that place of meekness where you're teachable before the Lord, where he's doing things and you know he's doing things. You can feel his power. You can feel his presence. And the more you feel that, the more you want of God. Some of you need to quit pointing at people and saying, they're the reason why I don't serve God. People will always fail you. You have a pastor up here who is flawed. I don't have it all together. Some of you are going, really? Yeah. I need God to bring me into a place of wholeness in my life. I need to look to him in every facet of my life and let him be the Lord of my life, the king of the kingdom in those particular facets of my life. But the more I get into his presence, the more I realize it's not about me. It's about him. Amen? And he produces that hunger and that thirsting after him. Where you want, the more you get of him, the more that you feel filled and satisfied, but the more you want more. Amen? It's not like the Bible talks about honey in the Old Testament. He says, too much honey, it's not good for you. But it's sweet. It's good. I I love honey on my stuff. But too much, I'm going to have a gut ache. God is never like that. How many of you know? And he wants to change us from glory to glory to glory. We go from this level to the next level. And yes, there are devils at every level. But you know what? Jesus overcame. Therefore, we can overcome in those things. So... He fills us. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. He wants to pour into you and feed your spirit to the point of overflowing today. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 says this. He says, yo! (laughs) It says something else in the New King James, but I'm not going to say that here because I'm going to lose you. You You know what it says? Ho! Ho! We're not used to that word except for in certain. So I said, yo, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price? Why do you spend your money for what is not bread, for your wages, for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your your soul shall live. Cruel and I were able to go to the, the camp at Auschwitz over in Poland, the Nazi camp where they held people. And all along the walls, you see on the inside of this camp where they would come in and they would cut all the hair. They would put, they would take the glasses. They would, uh, it, it was just tremendously evil. And so there's a whole rooms that are filled with suitcases of the Jewish people. Empty suitcases. Whole, there's whole rooms that are filled with glasses, with hair that they saved from these Nazi camps. And when you look around the walls and you look at the pictures of all these emaciated people, you realize they didn't get the food that that was needed. They didn't get 
the, the correct amount of water by any means that was needed to survive. This was evil that was personified. People were treated so inhumanely without adequate amounts of, of food and water and shelter. And, and, and you look at these pictures and you go, why? Why did this have to happen? Because we live in a fallen world. And every so often we see the evil of the times. And we, where we see Satan wanted to snuff out the whole Jewish people during this time. And we've seen this periodically uh, through times. And those are the times where the body of Christ needs to stand up now and not be a part of that demonic influence that's in the earth. Those are the times where we can stand up and be a part. And, you know, right now we're supporting uh, 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 an organization over in Israel right now that is called FIRM. And it's, and it's uh, for is Israeli-related ministries. And they're currently feeding 100,000 plus over in Israel right now. How many of you know we can't turn our back on Israel today? We can't. We've got to stand with the nation of Israel because no matter what, how many of you know it's God's nation? There is still a blessing on the nation of Israel. The Bible says if you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. If you bless Israel, you're going to be blessed. And so it's important for us that we're standing on the right side of that. But as I looked and, 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 and saw these people at the, at the Nazi camps and the, the different places, and, and it, they were completely devoid of life on the inside of them. They said that there was probably over 6 million that were killed in, in, that, uh, uh, in those camps that were in Poland and the surrounding areas. The agenda was to snuff out. The agenda was to steal, kill, and destroy. But how many of you know God wants to pour out abundance of life into his people? If we will hunger and thirst after righteousness, God will fill us to complete satisfaction in our life. How many of you know that? He'll fill you. Don't get so caught up in just the physical needs because man doesn't live by just bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's how important that words from heaven are today for our life because we live by every word. How many of you know that today, the planets and the universe today is propelled by God's word. One spoken word set everything into motion and gave it whatever was needed. If you're in a place of need today, God wants to meet you. God wants to meet you. Take away the excuses today. Somebody stand for Christ, amen? Recognize that, that total lack in spirit, and recognize you possess heaven when Christ is in you. Mourn for the sickness of sin. Many of you, when I was just talking about these, these camps, many of you were mourning on the inside, recognizing how evil the death of all those people were. But the Bible says he doesn't leave us there. He brings us into a place of comfort. And then we come into that realm with God. God, I just, I want your word inside of me. Teach me your ways. How many of you know the Holy Spirit's the greatest teacher today? 
He teaches us and leads us into all truth in our life. Nobody's left out in that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That you're, There's a stirring inside each of us to come closer to a God who loves us and is pouring out from heaven into us. We'll get back to this this next week. I, always, I, I never know where to close, you guys. You guys know that, right? But I want to tell you something. There's a God who made a way for you. You are kingdom people if Christ is within you. You are kingdom people. Let's live after the kingdom. Amen? Some of you need to divorce the kingdom of this world and find your citizenship in heaven today. Amen? Father, I thank you. I thank you today for your goodness, for your plans and purposes in our life being established. Thank you, God. If there's anybody in here today who doesn't know Christ and hasn't asked him in, today is your day. Don't wait for the tomorrows of life. Come and get prayer today. Come to the altar of the Lord. Come and ask him in. You don't want to wait for that tomorrow in life. Ask him in today. Lord, I thank you for the stirring of the Spirit of God in this place. Sometimes, Lord, we feel uncomfortable for a reason. There's a reason. Lord, it's not always these these great feelings. Lord, it's sometimes in this this area, God, of, of being uncomfortable, recognizing that there's more. And Lord, you're calling us up higher. You're calling us to overcome. You're calling us to occupy. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And do what you're calling us to do. Father, I thank you for touching us right where we are. For freeing us from past issues. And bringing us into this new place in you, God. It's a new, broad, fresh place from heaven. Thank you for that, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.